so we just arrived to Emory. It's so nice. It's beautiful here. And the weather is sunny, unlike Indiana. Our hotel's not ready, so we're gonna go eat. Yep, let me show you guys the campus. So nice. <laughs> this campus is beautiful. We're staying at the Emory Conference Center. You just want to vlog me because I ain't got them socks on now. <laughs> So we're currently trying to find something to eat. But the thing is this, when I was in the nursing anesthesia program, I didn't have this, but I knew what it was. I knew what it was, I recognized what it was, but I knew my stuff. So the more questions they asked me, I knew the answer. And then after they knew that I knew that, they went to somebody else. <laughs> so if you can just demonstrate, like, what type of questions that you would get when you would do? Or how do you mentor someone to ask that? So when I was a student, I was asked everything. Um, I, uh, my program, I guess the clinical sites I went to, they were heavy on you know, verbally challenging you at stressful times during intubation, during emergence, to see if you could you know, focus on a, a really critical task and at the same time be able to have the cognitive ability to focus on other things, you know, talk and chew gum at the same time. So Bank, um, my school, they're very, very detailed, about six, seven, actually minimum seven pages. So we get our, our patient um, about 3 p.m. and um, we can look up the patients from home. Um, a lot of places use Epic. So we have their chart readily available to us. Um, you know, you go into the typical comorbidities, you know, their weight, everything, everything, every little thing about your patient. Um, not just because you're gonna get questioned about it, but because you need to know this for, your, for yourself. When your, when your CRNA leaves the room. Um, so you're using multiple sources, multiple books, maybe a Vargo app, and you're developing you know, every single thing you're gonna do for the patient from them going to sleep, to how you're gonna maintain them, to how you're gonna wake them up, um, the drugs, the doses, everything goes on. That's kind of like your lifeline, if you ever have to refer to it. Um, if they are time consuming, and I still have to do them, even I think Teddy's um, you might have to do it anymore. You're out. <laughs> um, so I still have to do those every single day, every single patient. I have a long one and a short one, um, and it's just it's it's a savior if you ever need to look back on it. How many hours do you guys spend studying? <laughs> well, um, we know. Well, now since I'm a senior, we're in the OR Monday through Thursday, and we have class on Fridays. Days are kind of long, so you study in the evening time, after clinical. Most of my, week, all of my weekends, I'm studying like nine, 10 hours on Saturdays and Sundays, because that's essentially the only time I really have to study, because in the evening time when I get home, I mean, it's, it's been a long day, and mentally, you're just really not there. So if you try to study maybe two or three hours, I try to study maybe two or three hours in the evening time. So 12 plus, <laughs> 40, 40, 50 hours a week. I mean, it's, yeah, it's all about and, um, but the Army program really provided that I got to take my mind off the financial part of it and focus on school. They pay you while you're in school. Um, once you're done, you have a guaranteed job for five years. And then if you want to get out, you can get out and, um, and, and uh, practice independently because 
The training in the military is second to none. I will say hands down, I do not regret it. It's the best. I think it, okay. anesthesia school, no matter where you go, is gonna be the hardest thing you do. It is so difficult, it is so physically draining, mentally draining, they will always challenge you. But I found, you know, it's gonna be hard no matter where I go, but to have that financial part taken uh, off my plate and to be secure financially, that was kind of the benefit. Um, so to date, just any of you, what's the hardest thing or that you've had to deal with to date and, and how did you overcome that? Preceptors to me is one of the hardest things to deal with. Um, I think it's going to add another at stress on top of you taking care of your patients. And then again, being a minority can be challenging sometimes, especially being down in the South where we are. Um, but I found... <laughs> Just kind of like focusing and knowing what you're doing and knowing your stuff, you can't, you can't beat that. They can't take that away from you. So that was my, one of my hardest stressors. Y'all have stress. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the same thing. Preceptorships, um, you know, it, it's it's rough. It's some of the sites and you know you have a lot of cultural barriers to break down when you come into a clinic to a hospital where it's predominantly you know Caucasian. Caucasian women, you know, predominantly, it's just, sometimes it can be a little rough, sometimes they're just not ready. They're just not ready for, you know, for the, for the, for, for the change. Yeah. <laughs> you know. I actually had an issue a couple, you know, it would have been the last two weeks, actually, um, had some issues. And my clinical site actually went to the job at, um, you know, I'll be the first black male in the history of the anesthesia group to wow. be practicing at this group. <laughs> Some, you know, some of the CRNAs are just not really ready, you know, so it's trying to sabotage me a little bit, you know, make things bigger than what they really needed to be. Probably not working was contacted, but fortunately I had, I had a couple of anesthesiologists that are part of the group that called my program I worked to the family and back me. So it's really good when you have support, you know, people can really see your clinical strength and, you know, see your character, you know, despite what some CRNAs who are not really ready for the culture change can try to, you know, misperceive portray you as you know it's wrong so yeah preceptor perception can kind of be I think that's probably the roughest you know making sure you do the right thing because sometimes you can do something they wouldn't do or sometimes you can come off you know come off maybe a little too confident or maybe a little too intimidating you know because of you know how you are as a person it really doesn't mean any harm but so you can just you know yeah it's yeah, preceptorship. I think, I think the key to that, um, like Dr. Gold was saying, was you have to know your stuff. And it may feel unfair because it is, but you have to know your stuff. They will ask you questions that they don't even know the answer to, just to see if do you know. And uh, try your best, try your best to know. You're not gonna know every answer, and they know you're not gonna know every answer, but try your best to know your stuff. You'll be intubating, they'll be asking you for the chemical properties of sevoflurane, and it's like, I'm trying to intubate. It doesn't matter. That's not an excuse. Know your stuff. Know your stuff. Be ready to be verbally challenged because they will come for you, and when you answer right, what are they going to do? Right. You know? So just know your stuff. And this is for all the
you get your tube because this is where you're going. Okay? Even if you're in the molecular cluster, you're in the mouth. Okay? Because that would be the hand and tube the road Once you get it. Okay? Out here. Out here. And then go slowly like yeah, the yeah, you're right. You're going to guide you. Okay. 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 And blue means it's going away. So there are times where sometimes if if the way your probe is oriented or canted, you know, tilted a certain way, that an artery can appear blue and a vein can appear red. So the biggest thing to remember is compressible, not compressible, right? That's how you're going to get yourself out of trouble. Just because it's red and just because it's blue, that will never save you in court. Well, it was red on the screen. No. Yeah. I'll take this, and it's already so sterile. I use this and mark. So how perfect is it? You do like this. That's a bullseye. Mm -hmm. That's a bullseye. Right? So, we've infiltrated skin wheel. Everybody in here got TV shots before, right? So, just like doing a TV shot. Stay on the surface of the skin. You're going to localize it nice and good. Come back in here. Man, you're going to feel some pressure. Where's that other two? I was going to say, this is the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> What's going on with my picture before I go to sleep? So when I come in, I do a thorough history. You know, I see a picture, you know, has asthma. I'm not going to want to use those, those really pungent bottles. You know, when you guys need something very hard, like a lemon or something, or champagne, and that, that uh, right there, that's, uh, that's what you want to do. Healthy looking tissue of what the lung should look like versus all this black. Of, and so you can see how unhealthy this lung is. I think it's just a disease process with this particular something. You see a COPD, emphysema, something. And you can see how enlarged his heart is. And you just feel how unhealthy that particular tissue is. Yeah. So you start thinking about your patient. Yeah, even if you Right. I mean, it's like a parking muscle. That, you know, 